Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Animus Corporation, providing insulin delivery products for people living with diabetes and part of the Johnson & Johnson Diabetes Care Companies. And by Dexcom, take control of your diabetes with the world's first continuous glucose monitoring system that sends glucose readings directly to your compatible smart device. Live life on your own terms with Dexcom. Hi, it's Stacy. Just a reminder, this podcast is not intended as medical advice. I am not a doctor. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacy Sims. This week, going to college is a big milestone for any student. But when a person with diabetes heads off to school, there are unique and challenging issues. The College Diabetes Network offers help and support. My guests talk about what CDN means to them. Trevor is a student at University of Georgia. I have these guys who also have diabetes, um, who can relate, who can help out in case I need it. And so at the end of the day, I think that's the mission of CDN, and I, I really do love the fact that I have that here at UGA. You'll hear from Trevor and two other college students involved in CDN, plus Mindy Bartleson, who is the program's assistant and an alum, plus some listener feedback, always glad to get that, and a little bit about Diabetes Awareness Month. It all starts now on Diabetes Connections. Welcome to Diabetes Connections. I'm Stacey Sims. So glad to have you here for another week of the show. And if you're brand new to the podcast, great that you found us. Glad to have you here as well. The idea behind Diabetes Connections is to have a show where we can talk about news and issues and do interviews with people living with type 1. Basically, it came out because I have a background in broadcasting. I was a local TV and radio reporter and anchor for many years. And my son was diagnosed with type 1 almost 10 years ago, right before he turned 2. So I hope you enjoy the show if you're just finding it. And we have lots of archives as well at diabetes-connections.com or on whatever podcast app you are listening to right now. And yeah, it is uh, November Diabetes Awareness Month, but really every week is Diabetes Awareness Week here on the show. But there are a few things going on that I'd love to make sure that you know about. Earlier this week, I took part in World Diabetes Day Twitter chat. I will link up at uh, diabetes-connections.com under the helpful links for this episode. I will link up uh, some more information about that, how it went, and the hashtag that you can search. And even if you're not on Twitter, this is actually really easy to go back and read, although it's a 24-hour Twitter chat, so boy, is there a lot of it. But I talked about media, so I'll be able to link up um, a little bit about how it went for my part of the chat. Really looking forward to that. I'm kind of extending Diabetes Month into December a little bit because on December 3rd, I'll be at the JDRF Walk in Naples, Florida. And then on the 6th, I will be doing a, another Twitter chat, a DCDE chat, and that's all about um, the, really the, the quest or the pressure for perfection, especially among parents of kids with type 1. So I will link up all the information on that. I wanted to share with you a really nice message I got on the Beyond Type 1 app. And we've talked about Beyond Type 1 here on the program. If you're not familiar, this is, uh, it's a community, it's a website, uh, it's a fundraiser for diabetes causes. They are, are pretty new. I want to say um, they're about a year and a half, two years old. And they came on the scene just gangbusters. And they have an app, you know, just on the phone or on your mobile device, as they say. And it's basically, I'd call it Facebook or Instagram, but just for people with diabetes. So it's cool. You can connect to people in your area. Uh, parents can connect to parents, kids or, you know, teens with teens. And Sean sent me a note. I put many of the podcast episodes out there. And uh, Sean said, hey, Stacy, I wanted to say hello and let you know that I'm loving your podcast after subscribing a few weeks ago. Being a recent Medtronic pumper myself, I especially like the episode on the Medtronic hybrid closed loop pump, a very insightful podcast with some great questions, including a few tough ones. Your podcast is an excellent service to the diabetes community. Thank you, Sean. That just made my day. I loved hearing that. And we went, we kind of went back and forth and had a conversation. But, you know, when I'm doing these interviews, 
I want to make sure that you're getting questions answered that you would like to ask, right? Because there's not uh, there's not a lot of news outlets. There's some great um, online information. I, I usually point to Diabetes Mine, which is part of Healthline. Um, there are many other uh, diabetes news sources, but there's really nothing, in my opinion, like this where you can hear the newsmakers talk about their products. And I think when you listen to interviews, you get a better idea and a better sense of the people behind it than you might when you're just reading the printed word. Of course, I'm biased because radio is my true love. I I did that for more than 10 years here in Charlotte and continue to do so on a part-time basis. So let me know what you think. You can send me reviews on Beyond Type 1 or email me. Criticism is fine too. But let me know what you think. And thanks again, Sean, for that. All right, let me give you a quick word from our sponsor. I love working with Animus. You know that. After more than nine years, I love Benny's Animus Insulin Pump. You know, I met a lot of you recently at that great JDRF walk out in Los Angeles. And that was so much fun. It was great to hear why so many of you love the Animus experience as well. They offer a choice of insulin pumps, so you can choose the one that's right for you or for your child. And with kids, it is great that the Animus pumps really fit an active life. I love talking about our experience with Animus. They make it easy with great products and incredible customer service. Find out more about Animus. Just go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Animus logo. I mentioned the JDRF walk out in Los Angeles, and if you haven't heard that episode, that's just from last week, uh, you can always go to the website, diabetes-connections.com. Uh, the last few episodes are right there on the homepage. Of course, you can always go through whatever podcast app you listen to as well. But on the homepage, I also have information about every episode. If you click on the individual episode, you'll see that helpful links opens up there. And in the upper right side of the desktop version, it's right in the middle there in the mobile version, there's a search box. So you can look for things that might interest you going back to the last year and a half, all 80 plus episodes now of Diabetes Connections. Wow. All right, so I wanted to tell you about something that happened to me recently. And I have... um. I've had back problems on and off my whole life. Uh, I was probably born with a propensity to it, but I got in a car accident when I was uh, about 13 years old. And so I won't bore you with all the details, but I'm a mess. And I, I every couple of years, something crops up and then I go to physical therapy and I stretch and I do everything I'm supposed to do. And, and actually for the last couple of years, I've been working with a trainer because I wanted to get back into shape. But every time I try to run, you know, I mess up my back. So we've been doing all this great flexibility, balance, uh, weight training, and it's been really great. I'm not a, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm really, I don't like to exercise. I'm one of those horrible people, but I do it. It's good for me. I always feel good when I'm done. A couple of weeks ago though, I started getting some really bad pain, you know, the classic pain down your leg, the sciatica stuff, blah, blah, blah. But I have, the reason I'm telling you all this is because I have a TENS unit that I used a few years ago that I pulled out of the closet and that really helps me. A TENS unit, uh, if you're not familiar, is basically it works by stimulating um, your, your skin and your nerves to prevent pain signals from reaching the brain. It stands for transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. And it's a definite talk to your doctor kind of thing. Although they sell them now in the drugstores, you can get it over the counter. I think like the icy hot people make one. <laughs> but I got mine with a prescription a couple of years ago. And you basically, you put electrodes on sites on your body where the pain is. They teach you how to use this. And then you have a little device that looks just a little bit like an insulin pump, but bigger. And you clip that to wherever you can. And then you send a current into the electrodes and into the skin. And it basically like tingles. They call it like a bee sting, a massage, and it reduces your perception of pain. It It's really, I'm, this is, I'm not doing a commercial for them. There are different brands. And again, talk to your doctor, but it really helps me. And um, what's funny about it, and the reason I'm bringing it up, is because I've been wearing it in public for the last couple of days. And I can't say I'll ever know what it's like to wear an insulin pump. But I had so many people looking at me, and you could tell some people wanted to ask, and some people did ask, and some people didn't. But I I just kind of realized this but this is what it must feel like a little bit to have people staring at you when you either take out an insulin pump or you take your PDM or your, your meter remote. It was a funny feeling, um, you know, and I wanted to kind of explain to people, 
But then I didn't want to explain to people. So I don't know. Um, my back is getting better. I'm feeling much better. But it was just one of those weird things that I didn't remember thinking about the last time I wore this. And boy, it was uh, it was a little bit of an odd experience. But it is a lot bigger than an insulin pump. It's probably twice the size. And there's it's not like it has tubing. It's got like, but it does have a cord. It's got like, it looks like, um, I keep turning away to look at it. Sorry about that. It looks like, um, a cord that goes into an electrical outlet. So it looks basically like I'm robotic. (laughs) Enough about me and my back and everything else. We'll get to the College Diabetes Network in just a second. Let me just tell you a little bit about Dexcom. One of the biggest surprises to me when we started using the share functionality of the Dexcom system was how much more independence it had given my son. Knowing I could help him manage diabetes in real time, whether he was at a friend's house, school, a sleepover, or on an overnight field trip, gave me peace of mind while letting him be the kid he wants to be. With the Dexcom G5 mobile CGM system, dynamic glucose data can be accessed and shared safely and conveniently anywhere, anytime to your compatible smart device as long as there's an internet connection. The Dexcom G5 mobile is the only CGM approved for adults and children ages 2 and older with diabetes. For more information, go to Dexcom.com. College Diabetes Network says it is there for the highs and lows of college life. It was founded by Christina Roth, who was diagnosed with type 1 when she was 14, and then in college, she wanted to meet other students. So, you know, when you're thinking about finding people with type 1, you may have run into this yourself, you know, there are health information privacy regulations, HIPAA regulations, and how do you find people? So she set up a website, she, you know, provided suggestions on how to form chapters, And then uh, they filed for 501c3 nonprofit status in 2010. They are a full-time organization with staff, and they have become a resource for students and for some parents to basically help uh, navigate through, as they put it, the wonderful chaos of college. College Diabetes Week is this week, so there's a lot of movement on social media and lots of stuff to learn, and I'm really happy to be part of that. To that end, today I am speaking to three college students and one person who uh, is not too far out of college herself, that is Mindy Bartleson. Mindy was part of the College Diabetes Network when she was in school, and I spoke to her last year about this time. She is now the program's assistant for the College Diabetes Network, and she arranged for me to talk to these three students. So you're going to hear from Bridget, Trevor, and Hannah during the interview today. They had a lot to tell me about what CDN has done for them and about navigating college with type 1. Mindy and Bridget and Trevor and Hannah, thank you all for dialing in today. I appreciate talking to you. This is going to be fun, I hope. I'm, I'm excited. excited. I'm, I'm ready to be back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited too. <laughs> this is going to be crazy with four people on the line, but we'll do the best we can. And Mindy, let me start with you. Let's get a basic explanation. What is the College Diabetes Network? What is it, what is it all about? So the College Diabetes Network is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and our mission is to provide innovative peer-based programs which connect and empower students and young professionals to thrive with diabetes. So kind of the shorthand, not the mission statement, so we work with young adults and everybody who supports or works with young adults with type 1 diabetes through many different facets, including our chapter programming, which is our network, our ecosystem, which is everybody in a young adult's life, and then our tools, which is our website. Why would a college student need something like this? Is it about making sure you you know your rights? Is it about making parents feel better? Or is it about connecting on campus, that sort of thing? For uh, most students with type 1 that are, or they, or even if they don't have type 1, they might have a connection or just an interest. It's a lot about the connections on campus, but everybody's a little bit different. Some people, it's a little bit less about the connections and support, and it's more about getting involved in the community. And then it definitely does make parents feel better. <laughs> so that's also part of it. All right. So let me ask you, the, the, the three students that we have here today, um, to I'd like you to introduce yourself. Tell me where you're going to college, your connection to type 1, and if you have type 1, when you were diagnosed. And also let me know what, what year you are in, in school. And Trevor, let me start with you. Where are you? Where do you go to college, and what year are you in? Hey, um, so I go to the University of Georgia. I'm a third year there, um, studying fashion merchandising, 
and I was diagnosed August 16th, 2008. And then Hannah, how about you? Where do you go to school? When were you diagnosed? Hey, um, I go to the University of Memphis. I'm a junior nursing student there, and I was diagnosed on December 3rd, 2008. See, I'm trying to do math here. Trevor and Hannah, so you were both elementary school, I don't know how old you are now, 9, 10 years old? 12. And Trevor? Yeah, I believe I was 12 as well. Okay. And, <laughs> and Bridget, you don't have type 1 diabetes. Tell me your story. Uh, yeah, so I'm a junior at American University of Washington, D.C., and I'm studying um, CLEG, which is an interdisciplinary major, and stands for Communications, Law, Economics, and Government. Um, but I have, I'm not type 1 diabetic, but I have a lot of friends that are. Um, my boyfriend is type 1. He was my main connection to this cause and this disease, but I have um, found something I really care about. I've interned at JERF, and I'm Happy to be interning at the College Diabetes Network um, this fall. So that's kind of my story, and I'm really excited to share what Type 3 kind of um, has to offer to the Type 1 community. That's great. And I should explain, if you're not familiar with the phrase Type 3, because... Um, Bridget, I've also heard it called type awesome, but type three oh. <laughs> is someone who loves someone with diabetes. So I guess that makes me a type three as well. Mindy, are there many people without type one or even type two diabetes who are part of the College Diabetes Network like Bridget is? It really depends on the chapter. So most of our chapters do include the type threes or the type awesomes um, and type two members as well as type one members. It really just depends on what the chapter wants. So we, our role with chapters is supporting them and they can kind of go in any direction they want to. A lot of our chapters include the people who might not have type one for various reasons. Like they might be able to get support from people who know what they're going through as someone who doesn't have type one, but they're in a type one place. Like I had a roommate who got upset with me because she didn't know how to use a glucagon properly. And she talked to another roommate. And so she was like, okay, show me how to use it. So they were able to get support. And then it's just a good way to also find other type one members, more education and awareness and all different kinds of things, depending on what chapters do. That's great. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what college is like uh, for people with type one diabetes. Trevor, you had, you, it was not a new diagnosis. You, as you said, you were 12, several years to figure this thing out, right? Because you, you know it, I shouldn't, right. I shouldn't set you up like that, but several years to figure this out. And mm -hmm. then off to college, what was the transition like for you? Was it difficult? Do you feel like you were well prepared or did you, you know, did it go perfectly? Well, it was interesting. You know, I, the biggest thing, my biggest concern was that, you know, just like UGA, your first year, you have to live on campus. And uh, many of the freshman dorms involve like a roommate situation. And so my biggest concern was that whoever my roommate was, who's random assignment they would be taking on this responsibility that they didn't necessarily sign up for and so that added responsibility to them that that was just a weird dynamic for me to like put that onto mm. them and so what made it, it, that was really just my biggest concern is um managing diabetes in that way but i mean i looked out he was um he had a best friend who had diabetes and was very versed in the language and all the ways of like managing it so um i you know i lucked out um Beyond, you know, having CDN, he was a pretty cool dude. That's great. Did you? Um, that was my biggest concern. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know about CDN before you got to campus? I did. Um, well, I knew about Dogs for Diabetes. I don't believe it was a CDN chapter yet. Um, Mindy can correct me on that, but I did know about Dogs for Diabetes um, through Mindy. We both go to Camp Cousy, which is a camp for uh, kids with type one and type two diabetes. Uh, me and Mindy both go there. Um, as counselors now, um, and that's when she um, informed me that the organization was available for me if I were interested in connecting with other people with type 1 diabetes. And, you know, and I said, why not? You know, it's great to have someone who understands and um, can, you know, navigate the college life while still having diabetes at the same time. And Mindy, could you explain Dogs for Diabetes? This is how, is this how CDN started or is it just one of the big chapters? It's just one of the many chapters across the country. I think last time we talked, we had about 60 affiliated chapters, Stacey, and now we're up to 97. We're really close to 100 with 30 in the startup process, which is awesome. So it's just one of the different chapters around the country. So some schools do um, 
like the University of Memphis, a chapter of the College Diabetes Network. And CDN actually found dogs for diabetes when I was a sophomore. So dogs is the bulldogs, which is our mascot, and it's spelled D-A-W-G-S. We usually get the confusion with alert dogs, but <laughs> we um, go with our mascot's names, so like dogs for diabetes at the University of Georgia, a chapter of the College Diabetes Network, which is a mouthful. Wow, I wonder, is there a Syracuse University chapter? That's where I went to college. It would be like Otto or the Orange. I I don't think we have one there. (laughs) I don't think we have one there yet, but we are starting. We have so many startup calls a week. It's awesome and a lot going on. So we're we're over double the amount of chapters that we started. Well, let me know what happens at Syracuse, because I'm curious what they wind up naming themselves. That would be pretty funny. Hannah, Will let me do. yeah, let me go to you, Hannah. Tell me about your experience going to college and and how you wound up with CDN if you knew about it beforehand. But you know, were you prepared to go to college with Type One? Was your experience like Trevor's? Well, well, I started out at Mississippi State University, so I was at a completely different school when I first went in, and I didn't know I had no idea about College Diabetes Network. I know I just Googled it one day, and it seemed like something that I would really be into because I was really involved with Katie RF back at home. Mm. And so having it at school, just having that community of other people that had the diabetes, it was just something that I was really looking forward to. And it took me about a year and a half to get my chapter actually affiliated with CDN, but it was really, it was worth it. What were the challenges going off to school? Uh, Were you comfortable with managing everything yourself by that point? Were you worried about your roommate or the food on campus? That sort of thing. I think I was more worried about just how I would take care of everything without having a doctor down there Mm. Um, because I knew my doctor at home I could call them whenever but it was still three hours away and Starkville was not big at all so the hospital down there it was really kind of a issue with them because they they're supposed to know about diabetes but there are so many times where I had myself at risk going to the hospital just to make sure everything was it was really it's not the best ordeal <laughs> yeah do do is that something that still happens with you no now I'm back at Memphis so I can go talk to my doctor or I can go to a hospital that I trust not that OTH isn't a great hospital it's just I had times where when I was 44 one time they tried to give me water <laughs> and then <laughs> yeah it was not exactly what I was needing uh, Bridget, hang on one second. I, I definitely want to talk to you more about your experience as someone who's involved with CDN but who doesn't has to have type 1. But let me go back to you, Trevor, jumping off of that point there about emergency situations. Have you had bad lows that you needed assistance with in college? Uh, is that something that, you, as you said, you were able to talk to your roommate, that sort of thing? I don't want to scare anybody out there, but this is real-life stuff. Had you experienced that? Right. Um Not necessarily bad lows, uh, more along the lines of, like, really, like, awful highs to where, like, you know, I just feel like I can't go to class. But those are a lot easy to manage just because, I don't know, I feel like it's a more dangerous zone where you get into, like, the hypoglycemia kind of range. But uh, as far as, like, high blood sugars, that would happen a lot, whether it's because of college stress or me not taking the correct amount of insulin for the meal I eat. Uh, So that was always an issue. But, um as far as managing and making sure, you know, I handled that, it was a lot easier. And my roommate was really aware of the signs that, you know, each symptom had, each symptom was, uh, as far as for, like, highs or lows. And so that was really beneficial because he would see, oh, he's, you know, moody. Like, he's, you know, kind of upset. Maybe his blood sugar is high. And, you know, that conversation was kind of uh, was beneficial to us. But that's almost funny Both in a way, too, Trevor. Was he ever in your face? Like, are you okay? Can I do anything? And you were like, I'm no. fine. <laughs> well, yes and no. I mean, there were times where I, I had to be like, no, trust me. Like, I got it. I'm managing it. It's fine. But for the most part, it was very respectful and that he um, kind of listened to what I had to say. And, you know, the, the, the year um, progressed, he became more attuned to, like, what when I really was something wrong, like, you know, whether it was diabetes related or not. So that was kind of that. Was, that it, it got better throughout the year. That's funny. Um, and. Mindy, let me ask you, when you have a network like this, and I know there's a lot of information, we'll be linking up the website to diabetes-connections.com, what kind of help or advice do you provide students for dealing with roommates and for dealing with, you know, what Hannah brought up about having to go to the hospital? Do you help them with that sort of thing? 
So we definitely have a lot of resources on our website specifically. We also have our new Octa College booklets, which I believe you spread the word about for us. So they have things like how to talk to your roommate, what to do in certain situations that you may present with. We have a whole one pager about how to talk to your roommate. And one of the things we do kind of stress is humor. So that is a big part of what we encourage because that kind of lightens the situation. And we also have resources on our website for people without type 1. So if you are a roommate of somebody with diabetes, there's information on there for you. So with all of those resources and Mm -hmm. so much great information, you guys strike me as the kind of student I was. You know, you're involved, you're doing stuff, you're in clubs and networks on campus. But there are a lot of people with type 1 who don't think they need something like this and don't want to join anything. Um, have you met people like that on campus, and do you do you think it would be beneficial for them to at least look at this? I have. I actually met people at the campus I'm at now that they've just they've never really thought that they needed another person or a community of people that are going through what they are, and so they just kind of brush it off and it's like I'll take care of it myself. But I really do think I don't know. I feel that if you have that community of people, if you have any questions at all, you can always find somebody that's gone through it before or, you know, just having somebody to talk to. Like it's easier to talk to somebody with diabetes about like an assignment or something that if you did drop low or you did go high and you don't know how this professor is going to react to it, they might, they might know somebody that does. And the flip side of that question I'll give to you, Bridget, which is you don't have type one and yet you join something like this, which I think is great. But I'm curious what the reaction is from other people in the group. I mean, do they, does everybody assume you have type 1? Are there other people in the chapter who don't? Um, yeah, so we have a good amount of um, type 1s and then type 3s. Um, and last year we had, we kind of separated groups, and we talked about, like, what, what life is like with someone that you love as type 1. Um, so it's very for me to have those people just to talk about um like, just the relationship with the person and what life is like. Like, um, I carry some, like, a granola bar or something just in case, you know, and um, it's really nice to talk about that with someone who understands what kind of life that is. Um, so it's very beneficial for me in that sense. Um, and it's also beneficial to learn about what life is like for other people with type 1. Um, and, I don't know, I just... I am very, I feel very passionate because of these people, um, just learning about what they go through daily, but also it empowers me to educate others that don't really know about the disease. Um, so it's, it's very cool for me just to see, um, <clears throat> just people bond over something that they live with. And, um, it's good for me to see that we can be allies to them too. So I want to talk a little bit about concerns that parents have, if that's okay with you guys. And I'll start, you can tell me to buzz off because some of this is a little personal, but I'm curious, Trevor, if you've had to talk either with your parents or maybe with the other kids in the network about drinking and partying in college, because even if you're not wild partying, fraternity stuff, you know, there is some of a scene in that in college. Is that a concern that you've addressed with your parents? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I think every college student kind of has that talk with their parents. And when you have diabetes, it's more stricter, I feel. I think with my parents especially, uh, my mom was very much like an absolute, like, just don't do it, mm-hmm. which was kind of not fair to do because she also went to UGA. And I know she had her, she had a great time when she was there. Um, <laughs> so it was, it, I kind of took it with a grain of salt when she told me, you know, Trevor, don't drink at all. Um, and instead I opted out into, in, it was great having CDN in this way because I opted to educate myself as to how diabetes works with diabetes and, um, CDN was really great with that. Um, and just peers who also have diabetes, who've been doing the college thing for a while, having them, you know, inform me the best ways of managing your diabetes while going out is, you know, it really eased my mind, but it eased my parents' mind too when I informed that you, them that you know, like I have people who are who have done it before, who who know the safe ways of doing it, and that I can be responsible, um, taking part in that lifestyle and with my diabetes. So that kind of gave them an ease of mind, but it's definitely it's definitely a concern for them. Um, but I, yeah, like I said, the organization really helped ease their minds in that way. 
And I just want to jump in and, and say, yes, the drinking age is 21. And we're certainly not condoning any sort of underage drinking. But I think it would be, I would definitely be remiss if we didn't address this because it is part of college life. And Mindy, I don't want to put you on the spot, um, but I, I can imagine that this is something that is important for you all to deal with in a way that makes sense to the people that are in the network, but also um, is helpful. Can you address it at all? Yeah, so like you said, we definitely do not encourage drinking, especially underage, but we have resources for that, especially because alcohol is in college and it, you experience a lot of new things. So we have resources. We have a page in our Octa College booklet um, about drinking with type 1 diabetes, and it covers things from making sure that you tell people you have type 1 diabetes to encouraging you to wear a medical ID, making sure you eat different things like that and not using the glucagon. So we have that. And we also just launched our new resources for videos specifically. So we have a few videos of students talking about drinking with type one and their experiences and how they handled it. Cause I mean, I know I'm still like this. I don't want to read through a bunch of stuff. I'm going to watch something more likely. Hmm. So we have that. And we get a lot of questions from parents a lot too, cause they're just really nervous. Yeah. And I'll just jump in and say, if you're not familiar with, um, alcohol and type 1 diabetes. I'll link something up at diabetes-connections.com, but just to jump in and explain, the glucagon rescue shot that, that Mindy mentioned, it works by having your liver release the store of, it's more complicated than this, but releasing the store of glucose, or, you know, it converts the glucose. But if your liver is busy with the alcohol, because that's what processes the alcohol in your body, it cannot convert over and dump the sugar into your body. So a glucagon shot will often not work on someone who has too much alcohol in their system. That was an awkward way to explain it, but I think I got the point across. Hannah, have you been in a situation like that? Is that, and if you're not comfortable talking about it, you don't have to answer this, but did you find the network helpful in navigating situations like that? Um, I did. I've, like, what, like I was saying, when I um, first started looking into it, I saw all the different resources. And just reading through it and seeing how different ways you could handle the things that go on in college life. I mean, like you said, there's alcohol everywhere in college, especially when you go to SEC schools or like when I was at state, I mean, I was in a sorority too. So, I mean, I was always around different, different people and what they were doing. And no matter what happens, like is, if you tell somebody and make sure that they know like what's going on with you, you might not be, intoxicated but you might be having a blood sugar issue but they don't realize that because everybody else around them is mm. and so just having people around that know that you are diabetic and that you have different issues besides other people then they can make sure that you're actually okay and that you're not just being a college student yeah that's a great point because if you're low it could be mistaken and, and i'm curious too do you all check in with your parents like Trevor, do you do you check in um, every day or once a week? Do you have something like that worked out with your parents? Um, at the beginning of my college, you know, journey, I did a lot. Um, now, just because I, I don't know, I, it's really no excuse not to call your parents, and I should call my parents more. But um, not <laughs> said not every as college as student ever. <laughs> yeah, not as much as I used to. Um, but you know, they still, whenever I do check in on them, they do ask, you know, how I'm still managing my blood sugar, and they're still are very involved in my um, diabetes management in that way, but uh, not as uh, not as much as when I first uh, got into school. And how about you, Hannah? Me and my mom had this thing where we would talk at least once a week, so it was it was always there. We always had our our certain time to call and our certain block of time to cut out for our day. I, I just know some parents who ask their kids to text every morning, and I was curious yeah. if that was something. They both laughed. <laughs> Do either of your parents use do do you use a, a CGM either one of you and do your parents use the share or monitor you while you're away? Well, I do use a CGM, but mine doesn't actually share to my parents, and so I have to like tell them exactly what it was. So I wish I had that, but it doesn't. Mine doesn't work that way. Um, yeah, and for for me, I don't think I have the technology to share it with them in that way. Um, it's more along the lines that they ask, I'll tell them. Um, but they've been very hands off ever since. Um, after ever since gotten to school, um, getting to college, they've been pretty much hands off as far as um, monitoring where my blood sugars are. It's more along the lines of just checking in to make sure I'm not, you know, dying. 
Uh, so that's pretty much all that is in that range, I guess. I, I'm asking because, and I have, I, I know among the listeners that the parents are like, oh my gosh, and the, the adults with type 1 are rolling their eyes like, why would you do that to your kid? But, you know, my son's in middle school, and we just started using the share capability for school. He's had it for a while, but I didn't remote monitor at school until this year. And I'm not even thinking about high school yet, let alone college, but I, I imagine that, and this is new to people in my situation who have started using CGM and remote monitoring mm -hmm. when their children are young, how do you decide then when to separate as they get older? Any advice for parents on letting their kids go? Because, listen, I, I might get a lot of criticism for this. I don't necessarily think it's a good idea to monitor your college student 24-7, blood sugar, or for anything else. But, Trevor, how do you? what advice would you give to make that separation? Um, it really is just a matter of trust and really trusting your child, your 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 child to uh, manage their diabetes at a certain level. You won't always be there. So at a certain level, you kind of have to um, give them the space to learn and become the, the adult managing their diabetes. Um, but for me, uh, I, I think what my parents did was it, it took me showing um, that I can manage my diabetes at school. They, I would say probably high school before they were like, okay, he seems to have a pretty good grasp on it. Um, when they let me talk for the most part when I go to like my endocrinologist uh, appointments, and so just really seeing me step step up and take the responsibility kind of eased them um, into letting me, I guess, manage it on my own. How about you, Hannah? Any advice for parents to ease on out of uh, of being, you know, so involved? Well, my mom, she was re like she really wanted to stay involved with it. But when I turned 18, she was kind of more, you need to start making your phone calls. You need to start doing this. So that's when she kind of started thinking, okay, she might be going off to college. She might, like, we didn't know where I was going. We didn't know if I was staying home or not. And so she was, she kind of understood that you, we are getting older. We do need our own space to figure out what we're going to do. Because if we, if you're on us 24 seven all the time, by the time we are in college, if we do go away and if we don't go away for college, if we're, if we wait four years, then you can't be honest when we're 24, 25, trying to make our own life in the world. Like, we, we need to be able to take care of ourselves in case they're not there with me. And, and Min, yeah. Mindy, do you have anything to say about that? Do you, do you deal with parents who are, you know, very worried? Or I, I would imagine most parents do want to let go, but it's difficult. Yeah. So we, the, when CGM share became more of a thing, this is something that's gotten brought up a lot more um, with a you know, there's all kinds of different things going on. One thing we do have that we encourage with families is that they make the decision together. So we have a communications agreement or contract that you, that has a draft that you can kind of work through in our booklets. So like different things, you know, if I'm low for longer than this period, okay, now call me. So things like that. Um, and it really just depends on the family. We actually had a student, write a blog and I can send you the link about how her mom and she, how she and her mom handled the CGM share. For me personally, my mom and I knew that it was going to be very bad for our relationship because we didn't have the best transition for me into college. Mm. So by the time I finally caved and got a CGM because I was adamant about not getting it, CGM share then came out and we were like, yeah, this is a bad idea for us. So it really just depends <laughs> on the situation. Yeah, and I think that's great advice even without college. I, I, I'm often asked, what's my opinion on remote monitoring? And I'll be honest with you, listen, it's different for everybody. Every family has to figure it out. But I think you do need to have a conversation with your child. If your child's three years old, obviously, it's not going to happen. But, you know, as they get older, it's a good idea to talk to them about when you will communicate with them. When, you know, what are the parameters? Because if I had called Benny it, my son at school and said, you know, you're high. First of all, he didn't have a cell phone in elementary school. So what was I going to do? Call the front office and have him paged, you know, Benny, come to the front office. Your blood sugar is high. I mean, he just would have been mortified and he wouldn't have been happy at all. So we've come up with a system for middle school where I, he does have a cell phone now and he wears a pebble watch mostly so I can communicate with him because he hates having his cell phone out because nobody else is allowed to. And we have it set up so that he, I will text him at a certain time every day. And then if things I won't bore you with all the details, but like if he's over a certain number for a certain amount of time, I'll check in with him. And so far it's worked out really, really well. 
but I can't see myself texting him at lunchtime in the dining hall at college. I think that would be really weird feeling. Um, Bridget, let me bring you back in. I'm sorry you're hanging out there. Can you talk oh, to no us? Worries. Oh, great. Um, remind me what year you are in school. I'm a junior. Okay. Your, and your major is a, are you majoring in the communications law? Is that you? Yes, it's an interdisciplinary major. Yeah, that's great. Do you think you might keep diabetes in your life? Um, I mean, you have your boyfriend right now as type one, but do you think that's something that you'll keep as you move through your career, kind of in your back pocket, the knowledge and what you've learned here? Absolutely. Um, right now, I'm kind of looking at health policy and health reform. Um, and I'm, I'm just very interested in how we can have these devices that are so great, especially for diabetics and how we can get that access to people everywhere. Um, I'm just very passionate about that. And um, hopefully I will have that somewhere in my past. Um, but also I would love to be involved with advocacy, um, my government relations and grassroots advocacy internship at JDRF in D.C. Um, my sophomore year was the best internship ever, and I just hope to be connected with them still. I'm also, um, I'm also volunteering at the gala in the next coming weeks here in D.C. So going forward, I definitely will keep um, diabetes and the diabetic community somewhere in my heart and hmm. also hopefully do some action with, for them. That's great. Okay, so Hannah and Trevor, let me get back to you with a question that I, I wanted to make sure to ask, and that's about disability services on campus and registering for accommodations. Um, you know, until I talked to Mindy last year, I didn't even realize that college students could register if they had type 1 diabetes. And I'm curious if you do this, and Trevor, I'll start with you, if you registered for accommodations, if you could share a little bit about what that is about, if you did, and why you did. Um, so I actually have not registered just out of pure, I'm going to say laziness. Uh, <laughs> it's, it, 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 I did start the process once and um, never went, didn't, you know, do the final, didn't, I didn't go all, go through the just. It's laziness, honestly. But I'm going to guess that that's a very process. common answer. I'm not, don't be embarrassed about yeah. that. So tell us a little bit more about it. But you, you don't have anything against it. You just haven't gotten around to it. Yeah, I just haven't gotten around to it. Honestly, I wish I would just knock it out and get it done because I've seen the benefits that um, it has for students with diabetes. There's a lot of people, um, students in um, dogs for diabetes who have taken the advantage of this, uh, I guess, program. And um, the benefits are wow. Like, I know they, uh, one person has, uh, gotten like a larger dorm room before um as far as like you know testing accommodations uh it lets your professors know like in case you are low you have or you high whatever your blood is out of range it, you have that um excuse and you know you just you just have those accommodations so it is extremely beneficial i'm very pro that process i just wish i would take the time to knock it out <laughs> do you feel though like <laughs> i mean when you know of a student who's done that it doesn't sound like you feel there's anything wrong with it. They're not, they have a big sign that says, I have diabetes. Look at me. It doesn't sound like, oh. it's like that. Oh, absolutely not. In fact, when professors, because at the beginning of each semester, professor normally will say, is there anyone who had, who needs testing commendations or who has disability stuff? I don't even think they use that verbiage as far as like disability. I think they just, not that that's wrong to say, but just like, I just don't think they yeah. say it. Um, just because of the stigma that is associated with it. But it's very private. And it's very much, you know, if you choose to share it, you can. Um, but it, it's, it's, I don't think people look at the, that as a negative thing, also just because the benefits are just so great that it's, it's, it's not seen as a, um, a negative thing to, to apply for and have in back pocket. Hannah, how about you? Do you have you registered? No, I haven't. I just... <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm sure it's a really great resource on campus. I just, I kind of feel like I'm just going to go talk to my professors if I have a problem. And if I don't, then I don't have a problem that year. And it just makes it easier. I don't know. Have you had an issue that you've talked to a professor about and it's been okay? Well, yeah. Well, when I was in at Mississippi State last year, I was in the hospital for, it was just for a day. But I miss a lot of, I mean, when you miss one day in college, it's kind of like missing a week almost. And I went up and I talked to him about it, and it was just—he was really understanding about it. And he sent me all the lecture notes that I missed, and he told me I could come in anytime after class to come talk about what I missed in class. So it was really—it was really a simple process. So I never really felt the need to 
a register for something like it. All right, let me go over to Mindy. Are you like rolling your eyes and grinding your teeth here? Like, talk to us about accommodations. Um, no, I am not actually. It, we we have parents who push it a lot, and they want their kids to register, and we get a mix of I don't want to, or it, you know they don't want to they don't want to do the process. They don't want to be identified as someone with a disability. Like me, maybe they had not so great of an experience in high school. So when I got to college, I wanted nothing to do with disability services at all. Like I didn't want to register. I didn't want to tell anyone I had diabetes. I was done. But then someone told me I could register for classes early and I went, oh, okay, I guess I'll do this. And when I walked in, they had a letter already written, which for me, that was a big deal because I went, oh, this isn't going to be an uphill battle like high school was yeah. so I'm registered and we have a mix of students who do and don't a lot of the time we found out that most students don't know they can register mm. so it's usually not just a I don't want to or something like that most of the time they don't even know so we're definitely working on making that more apparent for them but we encourage it just because you can't backtrack. So if something happens, you can't retroactively register. So that's why we encourage it. And I use accommodations a few times, but not a lot. And I didn't have a lot of issues on campus. And, and again, just to, to reiterate, it doesn't mean that you walk around with a sign or a sticker or anything like that, right? It's just something that is in your in a file. Yeah, it's, it's in a file and disability services on pretty much all campuses, they abide by a lot of the HIPAA laws. Mm. So they are very careful with who they tell, what resources, like you go, like my school, I think it changed because they changed some things, but like you would go pick up your professor letters and then you would distribute them and you could distribute them how you want. So you could do it after class, before class, you know, and especially if you do it at the beginning of the semester, everybody's standing in line to meet with a professor. So yeah. you're just another person standing in line. I mean, some people like myself, when I eventually was like, oh, I guess I'm okay with diabetes. I mean, I basically wore a sign that said I had diabetes, but that was not related to disability services. <laughs> so this is College Diabetes Week, one of the many reasons that I'm talking to you this week during Diabetes Month. Bridget, why don't you take a second and just kind of go through what that means and what you all are doing this week? Sure. So College Diabetes Week this year is November 14th to the 18th. Um, and as an intern, I've been helping plan, develop, and prepare for this year's event. It's our third annual um, College IB, sorry, College Diabetes Week, and we're really excited. Um, and it's basically a week for um, awareness, education, and celebration of diabetes in college. Um, so we sent out for the first time ever a guide for all our chapters that includes some tips on social media and some other events that um, colleges and chapters can participate in to be a part of the College Diabetes Week, but also we have a communal aspect for the week. So we have another guide um, for individuals in the community or parents, alumni, um, and those are just filled with some tips and um, some ideas for them to be a part of the College Diabetes Week along with the campuses. So it's really a promotion and um, a um, a celebration of college and diabetes and just raising awareness about type 1 um, nationally, locally, and on campuses. And, and Mindy, if, if someone's listening and would like to start a chapter at their college, um, how do you do that? What's the best way to start? So the best way to start a chapter is to email us and go on our website. So if you email us, we'll send you the link, but you can go to the College Diabetes Network website and look up chapters and you can look on our map to see if there is a chapter or not. Not all of our chapters are on the map because we're getting started. So if you fill it out and there's a chapter getting started, we'll connect you, but you'll fill out a form and we'll set up a call and go from there. And then every school is different with how they get started and along with chapters. Excellent. And I'd love to finish up, if I could, by asking for some advice for students who are high school seniors right now or going to college maybe next fall. And Trevor and Hannah, if you could just take a second to think back maybe to when you were um, about to go to college, what should these students start doing now 
to make it easier for them or more fun or better or, or something to improve their experience their freshman year of college. I'll put you on the spot. Um, Trevor, can I start with you? Yeah, absolutely. What do you think that uh, they should do? Well, so what I thought was found really beneficial was first finding a pharmacy that's close to the campus. Um, in my case was the campus health center, but finding a pharmacy is where you can ha have your prescriptions filled and you can pick them up and you don't have to go all the way back home to um, mm. pick up any medications that you might need or supplies. Um, that was truly beneficial. So go ahead and knocking that out right out of the way was, uh, was great. And um, yeah, get excited. Know that diabetes um, will not hinder your college experience um, and that it'll, it'll be great. Um, and if there is a chapter, um, look into joining it because I really um, found it beneficial that um, having, I guess, the resource of CDN in my back pocket. I'm not as involved in doctor diabetes as I was um, last year, but even though I can't make a meeting, I still know that um, I have these guys who also have diabetes, um, who can relate, who can help out in case I need it. And so at the end of the day, I think that's the mission of CDN, and I, I really do love the fact that I have that here at UGA. Wow. How about you, Hannah? I would say one of the biggest things is don't be afraid to tell people that you have diabetes, mostly because if people don't know, then you're kind of by yourself. And if they do know, they might know somebody else on campus with diabetes. Because when I went to Mississippi State, I didn't know a single soul there. I mean, I might have known of a few people, but it really, it was a really great thing to get to know people that had diabetes. So I could talk to people, just not be by yourself. Don't be alone. Don't go out and join other clubs too. Like if they have CDN, that's great, but also get involved in other ways. So that way you don't just don't define yourself as just diabetes, but have fun with it. <laughs> Mindy, you want to get the last word in here? Even if you might not want to join CDN right now, that's okay. We have options where you can just be a student member to get benefits and it's free. So like up to date on research, news, things like that. But CBN will always be there, so you can get involved later. Like, we have some students who wanted nothing to do with it for about two years, and then something changed their mind, and then they got involved. So that's a big thing. Um, and I definitely think finding your community was a huge part for me and acknowledging that sometimes diabetes is not so fun. So that acknowledgement was a big struggle for me, and once I did that, it made college and diabetes a lot easier. Well, I can't thank you all enough for talking to me today. I'm putting this one in the back of my brain for when my son goes to college. And my daughter's only two years away, though. She doesn't have diabetes, but oh my gosh, college is coming up soon. But Mindy and Trevor and Hannah and Bridget, thank you all so much for sharing this with us today. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. More information on the College Diabetes Network at diabetes-connections.com. That was a lot of fun to talk to them. I, you know, It's always hard to get so many people on the phone, but it, I really wanted to get all those different perspectives. And you know, as I look down the road, uh, my older daughter is a sophomore in high school. She's only a couple of years from going to college. And of course, Benny, my kiddo with type one, is just starting middle school, but it'll be here before we know it. And uh, it was nice to talk to them and get their perspective. If you'd like to learn more, again, more information on my homepage and check out College Diabetes Network Network. I'll also put their social media links there as well because they're going to be putting out a lot of good information this week and beyond. If you like what you hear on the show, please tell anybody you know touched by diabetes. You can just forward them the newsletter. You are signed up for the newsletter, right? If not, go to the home page and it'll just pop up automatically. Um, if it doesn't, you can always follow on Facebook or Twitter and I put the uh, newsletter link out quite often there. Please do follow on social media. All this month on my public Facebook page, the Stacey Sims Facebook page, I am putting out pictures and stories of people in the Charlotte area touched by type 1, people who are thriving with diabetes. As you may know, I am a longtime broadcaster in the Charlotte area, radio and television, so I have one of those newscaster pages that everybody has. And in November, for the last couple of years now, um, I've done this, and I love putting out those 
faces and names and stories of kids and adults in my area living with type 1. So check that out as well. And I've been putting it on Instagram this year. You can follow me there. I'm Stacy Sims. Thank you so much for joining me. We have some great shows coming up in the weeks to come. We are going to be talking next week to a young woman who is on Broadway. She's been living with type 1 since she was a little girl. She actually starred in the touring company of Mary Poppins, as Mary Poppins. So you may have already seen her perform. I am thrilled to be sharing that interview. And I'm going to be talking in the weeks to come with a woman who has lived with type 1 now for 75 years she was diagnosed in 1941 and she has a lot of great advice and wisdom to pass on so please go ahead and subscribe to diabetes connections on whatever podcast app you're listening and join us in the weeks to come i'm stacy sims and i'll see you back here next week Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.